Hello, and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam, and on this channel I will attempt to describe the science behind distilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully it will whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you are more self-sufficient. Enzymes are a special type of protein that specifically acts as a catalyst in a chemical reaction. It essentially lowers the amount of energy required for that reaction to happen. All the reactions I will be referring to are hydrolysis reactions, which require water to be present. So all proteins are made of amino acids. All enzymes are proteins. Here is a general idea of what it would look like up close. So you can see all these amino acids here are linked together. Some of these amino acids are hydrophobic, some of them are hydrophilic. So after a protein has finished being constructed, it will start bending and twisting into various shapes like helices and ribbons. This calls it sheets. And then those themselves will fo uh, fold into a more complex shape like this folded protein here. Enzymes only work because their shape allows them to attach to a substrate, like a sugar, and affect the activation energy required for a reaction with that sugar. Because of this shape-activity relation, both pH and temperature will have a significant effect on an enzyme's ability to work or even exist. If either the pH or the temperature aren't within the acceptable ranges, they can cause the shape of the enzyme to change, and thus it'll no longer work. When this happens, it's called denaturing. So which enzymes do dis distillers need to be concerned with? Uh, first, a tiny bit of history. The first enzyme to ever be studied was in fact an enzyme related to distilling. The enzyme used to convert starch to sugar. The scientists of the day called that enzyme diastase, not knowing it was in fact multiple different enzymes doing the work. This is where the term diastatic power comes from when referencing malted grains. All right, now let's look at some sugars and their respective enzymes. The first one we got here is sucrose, table sugar. It's made up of a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule. The enzyme needed to break this up is called invertase. It'll break this one two, beta one two bond between the glucose and the fructose. It's called a 1-2 bond because it connects to the glucose's first carbon and the fructose's second carbon. If you use urea as a nitrogen supplement, it can form a complex with invertase and it inhibits the invertase from working. So no sucrose will be broken down. There's also no cofactor requirement for the enzyme invertase, which is a good thing. So you don't need to make sure there's anything else present for it to work. Invertase has an ideal pH between 4 and 6, and it has an ideal temperature of around 50 degrees Celsius or 122 degrees Fahrenheit, and it has a denaturing temperature of 75 degrees Celsius or 167 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, the next sugar is maltose or maltotriose, if you had another glucose here. It's made up of two glucose molecules. Uh, the enzyme needed to break this apart is called maltase. It'll also break apart maltotriose. It breaks the alpha 1-4 bond between the glucose molecules. There is no cofactor requirement for maltase either. Uh, its ideal pH is between 4.5 and 5.5, and its ideal temperature is around 40 degrees Celsius or 104 Fahrenheit and it denatures at 55 degrees Celsius or 131 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so our next sugar is amylose. It is a constituent of starch. Typically, it'll only make up about 30% at most. Uh, it's just a chain of glucose molecules stuck together, um, typically much longer than this. It can be hundreds to thousands of glucose molecules stuck together. First enzyme I'm going to talk about in relation to this is alpha amylase. It will break the alpha 1 4 bond between the glucose molecules to release glucose, maltose, maltotriose, or limit dextrins. It can start working from the reducing end of the amylose 
which would be this end. It's called the reducing end because the first carbon is free to bond. However, alpha amylase is typically random in where it sits to break off. So it could hit here or here or here or pretty much anywhere to break off to break these alpha 1,4 bonds. It also has a calcium ion cofactor. So calcium needs to be present for this enzyme to do its job. The ideal pH for alpha amylase is between 5.0 and 5.5. And the ideal temperature is between 65 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Celsius, or between 150 degrees Fahrenheit and 162 degrees Fahrenheit. It will denature at 76 Celsius or 168 degrees Fahrenheit. And before we go any further, I would just want to talk about denaturing a bit. Denaturing isn't an instant process. So when I say the denaturing temperature for alpha amylase is 60 or 76 degrees Celsius, that means you have about 10 minutes before the enzyme activity will drop to zero and it's non-reversible. However, even at 72 degrees Celsius, the upper limit of the ideal range, it will start denaturing after about a little over an hour. And enzyme activity will steadily go down until about the two hour point when it will stop. So the next enzyme I'm gonna be talking about is beta amylase. It also works on the amylose molecule. It also breaks alpha 1,4 bonds but it only releases maltose molecules and limit dextrins. It's a little more uh, robotic, I guess, in how it works. It starts at the non-reducing end down here, and it just jumps every two until it gets to a bond that it can't break. It also has a calcium ion cofactor. So calcium is required for beta amylase to also be uh, for beta amylase to also work. The P, ideal pH is between 5 and 5.5. The ideal temperature for beta amylase is a little lower, 55 to 65 degrees Celsius, or 131 to 158 Fahrenheit. It will denature at around 70 degrees Celsius, which is around 160 Fahrenheit. The next sugar I'm going to talk about is amylopectin, very similar to the amylose molecule. This is the major constituent of starch. Typically, upwards of 70% starch will be amylopectin. It is also made up of chains of glucose molecules, but you can see there's also a branch. So there'll be multiple branches of amylose chains coming off the main chain of the amylopectin. Glucoamylase is one enzyme you can use on amylopectin. It will break the alpha 1,6 bond to release this branch. And it can also start acting from the non-reducing end to break alpha 1,4 bonds and release single glucose molecules. There is no cofactor for glucoamylase and its ideal pH is between four and five. Its ideal temperature is 55 to 60 Fahrenheit or 131 Fahrenheit, sorry, 55 to 60 degrees Celsius, or 131 to 140 Fahrenheit. It denatures at a high temperature around 72 degrees Celsius, uh, which would be around 164 Fahrenheit. There are other debranching enzymes for things like limit dextrins. This is a limit dextrin. Limit dextrins form when Alpha amylase, only alpha amylase or beta amylase is present. So it'll get down to a point where the amylopectin just looks like this. Two molecules on either side of a branch. Alpha amylase and beta amylase can't do anything to this anymore. So you need something like glucoamylase to come in and break this bond. Or two other debranching enzymes would be isomaltase and pololinase. Those two enzymes are actually kind of hard to find though compared to glucoamylase. You won't find glucoamylase at, or sorry, you won't find isomaltase or pololinase at your local brew shop. Uh, I just put those out there as other options should you want to try them. 
Uh, next up is beta glucans. We don't have to worry about beta 1,4 glucans. That's mostly just cellulose. We're not going to deal with that. But beta 1,3 glucans are in every grain that you've had, most fruits, most plants. Uh, if you've ever had, if you've ever done a mash before and it gets real thick and gloopy, especially with rye or oats, or you've made oatmeal breakfast porridge. Beta glucans is what makes that thick. So essentially what you'll do is you'll add your beta glucan, beta gluconase, sorry, and it'll break the beta 1,3 branches between these glucose molecules. Beta gluconase has a possible cofactor of zinc. Uh, I only say it's possible because the studies I've read say that when you add an, a zinc chelator, chelators are compounds that will bind to metals and they will pull them out of solution. So if you add a zinc chelator, the enzyme activity of beta gluconase drops quite a bit. So it's a possible cofactor, but that hasn't been nailed down yet. Beta gluconase has an ideal pH between 3 and 6 uh, and an ideal temperature between 35 Celsius and 45 Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit and 113 Fahrenheit. It denatures at 47 Celsius or 131 Fahrenheit. Beta gluconase is also naturally found in grains. So you can do what's called a rest or a rest period. And that's essentially you just sit somewhere in the ideal temp range and you give it 30 to 45 minutes and that enzyme will do its work. Obviously you wanna start your resting at the lowest temperature range and then slowly work your way up doing rests for the other enzymes. That way you don't inadvertently denature the enzymes that can't take those hotter temperatures. The last two enzymes I'm gonna talk about, I've mentioned in the methanol video, they were polygalacturonase and uh, pectolyase. I think it was pectolyase, yes, pectolyase. These are two enzymes that break down pectin molecules before pectin esterase has a chance to break off a methyl group and turn that methyl group into methanol. So if you're gonna be doing grapes, stone fruit, or citrus fruit mashes, I suggest throwing in what's called pectic enzymes or pectolytic enzymes, if you can find them. A lot of brew shops or wine shops have them, so it shouldn't be that hard to track them down. And yes, I suggest adding them. In fact, just throw it in for any fruit you're gonna be doing. Better to be safe than sorry. And that's it for enzymes. I hope you learned something. Uh, if you wanna see more videos like this, please click like and subscribe and have a great week.